Hello, we meet again, Psychological Theories. Now we are going to explore unit for the cognitive uh, perspective. Uh, so the aim of the unit is for you to be able to identify the evolution of the cognitive perspective in historical context, analyze the different theories in the cognitive perspective, explain information processing in human thinking, identify the different types of memory, determine the strength and weaknesses of the cognitive perspective in explaining uh, human thinking. So uh, as an introduction, the cognitive perspective is a branch of psychology that focuses on the mental uh, processes. Uh, if uh, before this in uh, behaviorism, this the, the focus will be on the behavior part yeah, stimulus, respond. But in a cognitive perspective, the focus will be on the internal processes, the black, the black box, yeah, things that happen in our mind. Uh, cognitive focuses on issues uh, in which cognitive psychologists uh, want to help individuals to uh, solve problems. And actually, the emergence of the cognitive uh, psychology was to overcome the criticism of the behavioral uh, approach. Yeah, so cognitive psychologists uh, critique the simplistic nature of the behavioral approach in explaining human functioning, especially stimulus response explanation. Yeah, if you look at uh, behavioral. Uh, behaviorism uh, explanation is only stimulus and then respond. Yeah, uh, cognitive psychology believes that there must be some mechanism. Yeah, what happened inside the mind? Yeah, human is not just a stimulus and response. So let's uh view yeah uh a few development yeah in uh, the cognitive perspective. Uh, throughout uh, the years. Actually, cognitive uh, perspective is a very uh, early, yeah, early, new, uh, new field. Yeah, because the advancement in uh, the cognitive perspective come with the advancement in uh, technologies, especially the uh, computer, the invention of computers, the use of computers at that point. Yeah, so uh, around... 1925, yeah, Wolfgang Kohler published the Mentality of the Apes. Actually, Mentality of the Apes, it outlines or explain, describe the experiment in which chimpanzees was locked, yeah, was locked in a, in a cage yeah, with only two sticks. And uh, they put a banana outside. So the experimenter interested to see how uh this chimpanzee solve a problem but actually without being given uh, any reward they the apes actually can uh, uh solve problem by putting the two sticks together to reach for the bananas yeah so uh here it proves that uh although without reward yeah thinking or intelligence really take place yeah so Norbert Wiener in 1948 actually uh Publish a book called uh, Cybernetics, uh, Control, yeah, or Control and Communication of the Animals and Machine. Yeah. This is the uh, the first book, yeah, although in 1948, they already explored the concept of cybernetic organism, uh, how uh, we, yeah, as animals interact with machine. Yeah. And at this point also, Tolman, yeah, introduced the concept of cognitive. Uh, maps based on his experiment on uh, rats solving maze. Yeah, in uh, 1956, yeah, uh, George Miller introduced the magical number seven. Yeah, plus minus two. This is actually a uh, a publication on how how our working memory work uh, on uh, uh, on processing information. It was found that um, the working memory can handle seven plus minus two uh, items at one point. 
yeah, the working memory. Yeah. So Auric here he published the first uh, cognitive psychology book, and this is uh, the most recent uh, uh, or the uh, well-known model of memory called the uh, Atkinson and Schifrit. Yeah. Uh, who introduced the multi-store memory models. Yeah, if uh, you are used to uh, courses in psychology during your undergraduate level, yeah, you can see that uh, perhaps you are familiar with this uh, model of memory. Yeah, they are called multi-store because they believe that memories uh, are processed differently. So you need to understand that cognitive uh, psychology, they study something abstract. Yeah? If it is behaviorism, what uh, it studies is you can look at the behavior part, yeah? the outcome of the stimulus, reward, response. You can really take a look, but uh, cognitive is not like that. Yeah? Cognitive is uh, some you study in the black box. Yeah, something going on in your mind. So you need to have some assumption, yeah, your baseline before you can uh, study yeah, the, uh, the, the subject. So uh, among the assumptions made in cognitive field is uh, there are a series of processing system between stimulus and response. This is number one. So we as cognitive psychologists believe that there is a mediating system. Yeah, Actually, there is a system. We need to assume that there is a system between stimulus and response. Something going on there in the middle. Yeah, In which that is not the concern of our behaviorists. But we uh, as uh, uh, cognitive psychologists are um, very interested in that uh, mediating factors. This is what we study. So when... An individual, for example, receive a stimulus from the external environment. The brain yeah, will process the information before providing the best response. Yeah? For example, uh, you give someone a cookie yeah, after uh, performing well, getting an A or answering the right question. And uh, that person would smile. Yeah, but before smile, yeah, between smile and giving the cookie, there's some uh something going on. So this is what we study. And as cognitive psychologists, we prefer systematic, objective, control, and scientific method to study uh human behavior. Yeah. Scientific uh, to study human behavior. Yeah. So cognitive psychologists ana analogize, yeah. Uh, making an analogy that human cognitive process to serial computer uh, process. Yeah? Because uh, we assume that humans are information processors. You need to, like I mentioned earlier, cognitive psychologists come with development of computers. We are studying something abstract, so we need to assume this is how the mind works. You have input, you have output, and you have some sort of processing uh, uh, in the middle. Yeah, this is what uh, we assume. We assume that this is how we uh, process information. Yeah. So information processes in human resemble serial computer processing by which the human brain function like the CPU of a computer. And so this is uh, the assumption that we make. Yeah, so behaviors actually are controlled by thought processes rather than the uh, the reward yeah, given by behaviorism. It is actually the thought processes that control our behavior. So cognitive psychology believes that behaviors are the response made by thought processes such as uh, memory, perception, Problem solving, yeah, uh, and these cognitive processes affect behavior displayed by an individual. So we also are going to examine 
a few uh, scholars and their theories yeah in uh in in cognitive psychology yeah so we start off with uh Piaget yeah Piaget is a prominent uh, a prominent figure a prominent uh, scholar yeah in the field of uh, uh cognitivism yeah so uh if you look at this uh, diagram it summarizes the main uh the uh, the main tenets or the main uh, idea in uh, Jean Piaget's theory so Piaget's belief that uh, of schema yeah uh, of adaptation process and uh, stages of development this is what Piaget's come up to uh, uh, as his contribution to the field of uh, cognitivism yeah so we will take a look at each yeah of this a uh, 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 process so what is a schema yeah or singular we call it a schemata so according to Piaget a schema is a cohesive repeatable sequence processing components action that are tightly interconnected and governed by a community yeah so it is like uh, a set of linked mental images that help uh the uh help us to organize the information of the world yeah uh actually we are born yeah according to piaget we are born with this schema yeah uh for example uh babies are born with rooting reflex yeah if you notice newborn babies they already know how to suck. Uh, this is what we call as rooting reflect. Yeah, born with the ability to know how to suck. Yeah, to feed. Yeah, to survive. Yeah, this is an example of uh, a schema that uh, you are born with. Also, babies are born with grasping reflex. Yeah, if you put your fingers. Yeah, if you look at uh, newborn babies. Yeah. You put your your fingers in their palm. Yeah, you can see that the babies can, uh, actually retract. Yeah, actually retract. Yeah, uh, and actually can uh, grasp. Yeah, your 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 uh, your finger like this, and also the sucking, uh, reflex sucking itself. Yeah, they already have a schema for that. Yeah, so as you grow up, you will add on uh, add on to this. A schema and development of mental processes, yeah, refers yeah to the increasing number of linkages, yeah, because as you grow older, these linkages are add on, yeah, and then your schema, uh, will become more uh, complex, uh, as a result, yeah. So you build and you learn things about the world, yeah. And the second aspect is adaptation. Yeah, so adaptation is used by individual when encountering new situations or information. Yeah, so the process of adaptation, according to Piaget, can be uh, separated into assimilation. Yeah, and uh, accommodation. Yeah, on this one side and equilibrium on the other yeah uh actually piaget has a background in biology that's why the terms he used sometimes are biology in nature like a uh, uh, achieving equilibrium assimilation accommodation things like that yeah so assimilation is the process uh, by which human take new information and incorporate this new information into pre-existing knowledge structure you assimilate yeah uh, you already have some existing yeah schema you take new information and build a new one yeah you add on to your existing one yeah for example uh you consider spinach to be a healthy food so perhaps uh, you would incorporate a spinach-based drink into your existing schema of spinach, yeah, being a healthy food. Because, you know, although this is a, a spinach-based, 
consider this as healthy yourself. Yeah, accommodation is the process of altering. Yeah, when you accommodate, you alter your existing schema. Now nah, later, uh, uh, before this, in assimilate, when you assimilate, you add on. Yeah, in accommodation, you alter existing schemas uh, to create new schemas when new information does not fit yeah, into your existing schemas. Yeah, uh, so if the information doesn't fit, yeah, uh, for example, yeah, uh, not all, yeah, for example, I'm still using the spinach base. Yeah, if uh, you see that uh, uh, spinach based drink, uh, when you try it, yeah, it causes you to be sick. So it is not always healthy. Yeah, so you alter your schema. You said that not all spinach based drink are healthy for you. Yeah, so there, yeah, learning takes place. Yeah, and then you change your existing schemas. Yeah. So equilibrium here is the state that balance assimilation and accommodation. Yeah, you are a state of balance. You think you know something already. Yeah, at this point, yeah, you think you know something already, but when uh, new information come, you will have like oh, yeah, that moment. Whether you want to add on, yeah, you want to assimilate, or you want to alter, yeah, uh, accommodate, yeah. So your function is to achieve this equilibrium state, yeah. Uh, so when uh, during assimilation, yeah, uh, you want to achieve equilibrium to the new situation, yeah. You have uh, equilibrium already. You were uh, you are presented with new situation that create this equilibrium, uh, meaning that the oh, yeah, yeah. Is it like this uh, uh, when you encounter new information? So uh, sometimes uh, if you uh, change, you become accommodation. Yeah. So assimilation and accommodation uh, by the means of achieving equilibrium work together to form uh, adaptation uh, process. Yeah. This is how uh, we uh, learn. Yeah, according to a Piaget. Yeah. So Piaget also in, introduces the stages of uh, development, which involve uh, four different stages, sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. Yeah. This is very interesting if you have uh, small kids and you can test them. Yeah, to see whether they have uh they are in range according to Piaget's uh, uh stages. So here, for example, yeah, newborns, yeah, they are supposed to be in the in the stage of sensory motor, in which infants yeah perform basic reflexes and motor response only. Yeah, like uh, like I mentioned before, yeah, earlier infant stage uh, routine reflex. Rasping reflex, yeah, sucking, yeah. So their cognitive development occurs through their interaction with the external environment where the infants try to sort out how the world works, yeah. So these two core ideas are object permanence and egocentrism, yeah. And later when they move on, yeah, to uh, uh they stay grow up, yeah, pre-operational uh, state, yeah. So now the cognition, yeah, thinking, cognition, cognition uh, uh, process begin moving towards a symbolic stage. Uh, imagination begins in the state of toddlers, yeah. So you can see they engage in pretend play. Yeah, and then they begin to learn language, yeah, to represent object. Uh, and then they want to indicate intent. Yeah, they use language. Yeah. Before they interact with the environment early, yeah, in life with a crying, yeah. Uh, 
then they learn a language. Yeah. So children are able to express their need through language. Yeah. Although egocentrism is still evident at this stage, yeah. Uh, but uh, children still cannot uh achieve the concept of conserva conservation. Yeah. Then the ability to understand that certain qualities remain the same, although dimension of size um may change. All right. So. To understand the concept of observation, uh, for example, you have a glass of water, yeah, two cups of water. When you transfer a flatter, yeah, container, it looks like the water is actually changed the amount compared to a tall cup, yeah. So they say that oh, when you change, uh, water disappear. No, yeah? actually no, yeah. But as they grow older, they are supposed to achieve this, yeah. Uh, the uh the concept of conservation. Then they move to what we call a concrete operational uh, state. Yeah, uh, this is when they are in primary school usually. Uh, so you can see if uh, any children of this you have uh, can observe children of this age. So the hallmark, yeah, of this stage is the ability to think logically and internally. So at this point, children are able to use uh, logical thoughts. And operation in daily life, yeah, but uh, they only apply to physical object. And children actually pay attention to more, yeah. They can look at uh something at to more than one dimension, yeah. At the same uh at the same time, they can look at different perspective of something, yeah. So this actually can uh uh, it conservation, yeah. And the egocentric thinking decreases and children begin to understand their thought, feeling, and opinions might be different than others. Yeah, this is not uh, egocentric anymore. Yeah. Other the other might think differently of something. Yeah. All right. So 12 plus, yeah. Uh, they are supposed to achieve a uh, formal operation. Yeah, so they are able to think logically. Yeah, and then uh, at this point, supposedly they are adolescent, understand abstract idea. Yeah, able to use a uh, deductive reasoning. Uh, and then they begin to think in ethical, moral, and political ways in making decisions. Yeah, and they are able to generate more ideas. Yeah, well, and use hypothetical. A deductive reasoning method yeah so here yeah you can see that this uh can be achieved in stages although you can see or observe sometimes that uh, kids yeah, actually can advance yeah uh, they can uh, in terms of achieving the stages depending on how well they interact with the uh, environment so next we go to Vygotsky, yeah. So uh, Vygotsky is well known for the social culture approach, yeah, in uh, cognitive development, and the theory emphasizes on the role of social interaction in cognitive development, yeah. Not only the environment itself, yeah. For example, just now Piaget, how you interact with the environment. So, uh, for Vygotsky, they aid the social interaction, yeah, in the in the said environment. So, social interaction is important, yeah, for learning, uh, by enabling communities to generate meaning in the cognitive development uh, process. This is what the function of social here, yeah, in which communities, uh, help aid, yeah, cognitive development through, uh giving meaning yeah to the interaction yeah so we got skip believe that social learning uh actually precedes development this must happen first before you can develop and we got skip emphasize culture in a child's cognitive development especially of the higher mental function yeah so as an infant grows up the interaction with more experienced members of its culture will help develop fundamental abilities to become more complex and effective 
uh, mental uh, structure. Yeah, and Vygotsky also emphasized the role of language in uh, cognitive development and considered thinking to develop from uh, inner speech. So here, yeah. So for Vygotsky, if you look at the summary of his theory, yeah. So here is the major areas that uh, major areas in development, which involve the ZPD, or some uh, books say that ZOPD, yeah, but it's the same zone of proximal development, yeah, ZPD or ZOPD, yeah, the process of scaffolding, yeah, and more involvement of more knowledgeable others. So scaffolding comes with the language, and here all the theories are support with the cultural uh, development, yeah, in the individuals. So what is actually the zone of proximal development, the ZPD? Yeah. Uh, if you look at this uh, diagram, if you look at this diagram, yeah. So zone of proximal development is actually uh, an area, yeah, an area in which a learner, uh, between what a learner can do and what the learner cannot do, you have a zone here. So this area between actual development, yeah, as determined by independent problem solving and the level beyond the abilities of a developing child in the zone of proximal development in which under uh, guidance of uh, adults or in uh, or more capable peers that you can actually achieve this is how you learn yeah this is where uh support group yeah teachers come in place to help you uh uh enlarge yeah what you can do yeah this uh, area in the middle yeah so in the zone of proximal development there is a concept of lower and upper limit yeah if uh, at the lower limit children are able to complete the analysis and problem solving without uh, assistance yeah and at the upper limit requires assistance from skilled instructors to accomplish a task you know so this is how yeah uh, individuals learn yeah according to uh, Vygotsky, yeah, because of this, yeah, uh, they are reducing the, the zone of proximal development, yeah, so that they, uh, with help, they can achieve more. Scaffolding, yeah, can be in, uh, can come in many forms, encouragement, uh, instruction and observation yeah and the purpose of a scaffolding is to change the quality and quantity of support yeah actually is to hold yeah uh, uh, the, uh to provide a scaffold yeah help a push yeah to help the quality and quantity of support provided to a child in the teaching process the level of quality and quantity depends on the child's level of performance yeah greater assistance and advice have to be provided for difficult tasks but when scaffolds are removed yeah uh, when a child has learned to complete the task independently yeah you don't need help anymore they remove the scaffold you don't need instruction for something you already know how to do yeah this is uh yeah perhaps you know how to uh when you begin to drive a car yeah you need instruction which one is the how to how to start the engine yeah but as you learn uh you know already yeah so no one is giving you instruction on how to drive they just tell you okay drive here or drive there that's it yeah so scaffold refers to a temporary guide or temporary support yeah by more knowledgeable others but what is the mko yeah more knowledgeable others 
it refers to someone with higher capabilities yeah or understanding than the learner yeah in terms of that particular task you are trying to achieve yeah uh mko can be adults for example parents uh caregivers yeah, neighbors sometimes teachers yeah or their own peers who know more yeah more knowledgeable yeah uh, so these uh, individuals can act as an mko yeah learners can acquire new skills through observation or imitation yeah and can come yeah and nowadays in electronic sport yeah right now we go to youtube yeah watch videos um google yeah remember that uh, nowadays we google everything yeah uh sometimes we have uh, access to uh, tutors online yeah uh, in education or learning uh, processes all right so if we try to differentiate between uh, vygotsky and piaget's uh, cognitive developmental uh, theories vygotsky actually highlight the importance of culture so culture according to piaget does not really contribute to cognitive environment yeah, you can just interact with any uh, environment for learning to occur. Social interaction is a significant in cognitive development. And by helping to make meaning uh, of the external world. But for Piaget, cognitive development comes from uh, self-exploration of the external environment. Yeah, And through this uh, exploration, children are able to construct knowledge. Yeah, uh, so no need to have a social interaction for learning to occur. This is according to Piaget. Yeah, language is cognitive development uh, through which inner speech extends the higher mental processes of a child. Yeah, uh, language is, does not have a large impact according to uh, uh, Piaget. Uh, the assistant and guidance of adults actually aid in cognitive development. And uh, for Piaget, the focus is more on peer. Yeah, the focus is more on peer. Yeah, to help in uh in the cognitive development. And cognitive development is viewed uh, for any uh, by Vygotsky as a uh, holistic and also continuous. Yeah, but for Piaget, uh, this development happened in. Uh, stages yeah with certain target yeah at the end of this you achieve conservation for example uh, this is a uh, piaget yeah continuous versus uh happening stages yeah and and then when we are done now we are done with um piaget and Vygotsky. so now we move to uh Sternberg, yeah Sternberg uh, come up with a theory of mental self-governance and the uh, triachic uh, theory of intelligence. So the theories of mental self-governance, yeah, we are going to examine this, both of this. Yeah. There are three functions of mental self-government. Uh, Legislative, executive, and uh, judicial. Uh, legislative oriented, yeah, prefer to plan and make their own decision on tasks or project instead of being instructed by others. Yeah, this is uh, if you are legislative oriented, if the executive style, yeah, a different, this is different from legislative, is that they are like to be told, yeah, meaning that give me instruction what to do on a project and with this instruction they can uh, perform better yeah uh, legislative they prefer to plan this one is they prefer to receive instruction judicial oriented is the third one they prefer to analyze the rules and procedures given yeah they will judge and compare the existing project or structure to the others that they know of yeah they are evaluative of others sometimes on the basis of minimal information so here they judge first 
yeah and that they compare before they make any uh decision yeah so these are the difference between the three uh function of mental self uh, government yeah so they are actually for forms uh monarchic hierarchic oligarchic and anarchic yeah so monarchy oriented prefer to focus on one task at a time yeah they prefer to complete one task before moving to the next project one by one if you are hierarchy they prefer to handle numerous tasks and complete them within the available time frame uh oligarchy oriented they work on multiple tasks at one time but prefer that all the tasks be equally important rather than having to prioritize them so hierarchy and oligarchy uh actually they are uh almost the same in terms of they handle uh, multiple tasks at one time but um uh, oligarchy they like to place uh they do not like to prioritize because for for them everything is important yeah must be given equal rather than putting uh, 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 the tasks, different tasks in hierarchy. And anarchic oriented, they value uh, flexibility in uh, completing uh, tasks. So these are levels, scope, and leanings yeah, in theories of mental governance. Yeah, their levels can be local, they focus on specific, uh, concrete details in completing a task, yeah. Uh, this is like looking at the tree, yeah, and not the the forest. This is the type of um uh level they are uh, processing. Global, they focus on the abstract and global ideas. They look at uh, things globally, um. But sometimes they, if we are global in nature you will miss that tree yeah because you look at everything as a whole yeah perhaps you will miss that tree yeah so uh this is a difference between uh local and global yeah so the scope internal inwards yeah you like to work independently and external yeah you work outward and prefer to work with others or in a group, yeah. This is the scope, yeah. Leanings, whether you are liberal or uh, conservative, yeah. So if you are liberal, you uh you lean towards ambiguity and change, and most of the time they will go beyond existing rule and procedures in solving problem, yeah. And then conservative, you work within uh, extent rules and procedure you try to avoid ambiguity and minimize a change uh, this is a uh, conservative all right so um Sternberg also um uh, discussed the concept of intelligence in which according to uh, Sternberg it refers to mental uh, mental activity uh, directed toward uh, adaptation, if you still remember just now, adaptation to selection of and shaping the real world environment, yeah, to make it relevant to your life, yeah. And he believes that intelligence is very broad rather than single gender ability, yeah. So, Sternberg proposed a trikic theory of intelligence, uh, in which this theory contains uh, three elements. Three main elements, anal analytical intelligence, creative intelligence, and practical intelligence. And these three elements will form uh, something known as successful intelligence. So Sternberg concept of intelligence recognizes that every human has strength and weaknesses and intelligent people know how to maximize their strength and compensate for their uh, weaknesses. So let's examine of uh, these three components in intelligence. 
Yeah. Analytical intelligence enable a person to analyze, evaluate, compare, contrast, or make judgments about a problem. Yeah. A person with this type of intelligence excel at traditional uh, academic tasks and is good at logical problem solving. Yeah. Creative intelligence, uh, on the other hand, enables an individual to deal with new and unusual situation by using existing knowledge and skills. Creative intelligence help an individual to transfer information from one uh, to another. Yeah, it is very good in problem solving. Yeah, especially when you encountered a new uh, new task or new uh, problem to solve. Practical intelligence refers to the ability of individuals to adapt to everyday life using existing knowledge and skill. Yeah, this is practical uh, intelligence. Yeah, you you are able to adapt. Yeah, it provides uh, individual with understanding of what needs to be done. Yeah, in specific uh, setting. Yeah, if you have this kind of intelligence, you are very good at picking uh, non-verbal things that which is not being said and uh, using it. Yeah. And now we move to the next, um, uh, the next uh, thing, yeah, which is the memory, yeah. So when we talk, uh, when we discuss cognitive, yeah, one one thing is we touch about memory. So here, according to Miller, nineteen fifty six, the human brain is able to receive information from the external environment, process it, and respond to external stimulus and store information in the brain. Yeah, this is uh, how we process information. Yeah, in physical term, the sensory receptor. Yeah, here is a stimulus. If you look at this diagram, peripheral nervous system, your nervous system, and central nervous system of humans are equivalent to the hardware of the computer and the thinking processes or strategies used by person resemble the software of a computer. Yeah, if you still remember this um, field in psychology called uh, biological psychology or psychobiology, yeah, this, uh, this study the hardware aspect yeah, of uh, behavior. Yeah, uh, right now, since we are uh, discussing cognitive uh, aspect, the cognitive aspect actually the software. We study the software that allow this information that we receive from the environment yeah, through our sensory organ and make sense of them. Uh, that's why although uh, the same individual receive the same information, yeah, uh, we have we can have someone uh, sitting beside us exposed to the same amount of sun rays, uh, uh, looking at the same thing, but we experience it differently. We can be listening to uh, the same song, but we can have different opinion. Yeah, uh, perhaps you can say that song is nice. The other, oh, it can be better. Yeah, okay. because this is uh, uh, the 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 hardware. Yeah, is the same. Yeah, but the software can process the information uh, differently. So the main concept of information processing is that the human brain analyzes every piece of information that goes into the brain and then puts it through the test of several benchmarks before storing in the brain. Yeah. So you have a stimulus. This is that can be from the environment. Received through your sensory organs, eyes, ears, skin, yeah, um, taste, yeah, smell. Yeah, this is the stimulus. Yeah. So you start encoding. Yeah, start encoding. Yeah, you input. Yeah, and then uh, storage. And whenever you need the information, yeah, so you can uh, retrieve it or recall. This is the output and produce the response. This, perhaps, you can see. Yeah, the stimulus from the environment. But this is what's going on inside the processing part. Yeah, the response you can see. 
uh, the response you can see. Yeah, so it's clear that uh, uh, in a cognitive perspective, we study this. For behaviorism, uh, this uh, part is not of their concern. Yeah, it's not of their concern. Yeah, because they want to see stimulus, you put input this, you uh, have this kind of output response. All right. So uh, the encoding process is what? So when you encode, yeah, just now you see the diagram, the information from the environment, what you do is you change the information into the form that your human brain can store. Yeah, perhaps sometimes uh, you, you say it as um, make you understand. Yeah, uh, understand and then you remember. That's why it's hard for you to remember things that you do not understand. Yeah? So to aid the information of encoding, yeah, you need to help yourself to make you understand or relate the information. Yeah? So the system must be able to process it and we need to aid the system. That's why uh, we have different form of understanding between one person and another. Yeah? Uh, and then it depends on our existing schema also. Yeah, we learned about schema just now. It depends on our existing schema. How structured is it? How extensive is it? Yeah, to help us receive the new information, to help us adapt, yeah, uh, uh, assimilate or accommodate. Uh, this is uh, based on our existing schema, which is uh, different from one individual to another. Yeah. So there are three main ways information can be changed. You can change the information into visual. You can change into acoustic and semantic. Visual information, you know, of course, you assess through eyes, vision. Acoustic, you listen to it, yeah, your ears. Semantic is you uh, give meaning to the information. Yeah? So usually it involves language. Yeah. So research shown that acoustic encoding is effective for short-term memory. Yeah. For example, uh, you keep repeating list of groceries that you want to buy in the next five minutes. Yeah. For example, you said bread, coffee, sugar, uh, tea. Bread, coffee, sugar, tea. Bread, coffee, sugar, tea. This is a uh, repeating. Yeah. And uh, long-term memory. You need visual and semantic will be more effective. Uh, that's why when you memorize, uh, for example, for example, yeah, you try the repeating method, it only works for some time. After the exam, gone. Yeah, because you don't change it into deeper uh, uh processing. Yeah, deeper processing. Yeah, you don't give meaning to it, you don't put visual to it. Yeah, so you want to give a more meaning, you change, yeah, you imagine, yeah, you give meaning to the list what you are you are trying to remember, and then you change your uh change it into visual part that will be more effective, yeah, according to a uh, cognitive perspective. Okay, so human retrieve information most most efficiently in the same form, but they take it as they take in the information. Uh, this is how we retrieve the information as well, yeah. So storage, yeah. Uh, storage is the manner of information, and uh, the manner of information storage affect the retrieval process. If you still remember, you have um, a, uh, your own uh, a cupboard, yeah, where you store, yeah, wardrobe in which you store clothes. Some people really fold it very nicely, yeah. Uh, for example, for those who wear tudong, for example, they have color coded, yeah. You want uh, red. Yeah, you look at red part, yeah? So it's easier for you to recall, yeah? To find, ah, I'm looking for my sock, yeah? But some, if you store it ineffectively, yeah, imagine in the morning, how hard is it uh, for you to uh, recall information, yeah? Uh, I'm, I'm retrieving one sock, where is my other pair, yeah? Sometimes you end up uh, wearing a black sock with a stripe and black sock with dots, yeah, uh, things like that happen because uh, you cannot recall them yeah, because of ineffective uh, storage. So when information passed through your encoding system, 
it will be transferred to short-term memory. And if it is found to be important to the individual, it will be transferred further yeah, from short-term memory to long-term memory. Uh, you know already where it is. Uh, you know already, okay, uh, the sock is over there. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So adults can actually store five to nine items in short-term memory. Yeah, but uh, just now we learned about the magic seven plus minus two. Yeah, in the working memory. So recall or retrieval. Yeah, is the uh, term yeah uh, for the process of getting back the information. Yeah, ah, you want to remember. Yeah, this is the common term. Yeah, uh, you do it quite often. For example, if you drive every day, actually your knowledge is stored in your long term memory. Yeah, uh, you recall. This is a form of recall. You know where to insert your keys. Yeah, some are uh, the cars that push. Yeah, uh, for example, if you do not know uh, some cars, you don't have to have car keys. Yeah, you only have to have your uh sensors. Uh, this is where assimilation uh accommodation happen. You add more, not necessarily you need keys. Uh, sometimes you can just push a button. Yeah, so you push a button. Yeah, you push a button, but it, this requires you to recall things that you have stored. Yeah, uh, do. Do any of them do forgetting how to drive occur to you? Very rarely because you practice this every day, almost every day if you drive to work. Yeah. So uh this uh recalling, yeah. Uh is belief you can store, yeah, one trace on one location of the brain, yeah. Uh but actually, yeah. Uh we store, yeah, there are theories that they are one part, but actually we store, yeah, in multiple places, yeah, we don't have, because there are memories is, uh, if you study about memories, memories is a uh, multiple part, yeah, not only one type of memory, yeah, uh, not only one type of memory, and you can store, yeah, uh, at multiple parts of the brain. And some research demonstrated that long-term memory storage is a distributed process with different components of memory like visual, auditory, effective being stored in different locations. Yeah, that means that recall of memory is a reconstructive. Yeah, reconstructive process. This is not just one. Yeah, you can pull how to drive a car. Actually, it involves multiple memories when you want to recall the skill of how to drive. And then it involves map, map, yeah, your mental map as well. How to get to uh, KFC in your areas. Yeah, you have, yeah, not only your skill to drive, you know how only how to drive, but you don't have the map where to go. Yeah, so still, it's ineffective to, ineffective to achieve your goal. Yeah, so it is a reconstructive process, and each time a memory is recalled, it subtly changed. And when the memory is stored again, it is this change of version that is stored not the original version. So every day you learn. Yeah, every day you learn, yeah, how to drive and drive differently. That's why you build expertise. Remember when you start driving, yeah, you started driving, you went really slow, 40 miles an hour and annoy uh, a lot of people. Yeah, but right now you can just really drive. And then if you change state, for example, yeah, they say that uh Penang drivers are very bad. Yeah, if you come from a uh, kampung in Perlis, yeah, for example, yeah, or where everything is uh, calm, and then when you experience Penang, yeah, so uh, at first perhaps you have problem recalling. Yeah, I don't have this information on how to deal with uh, Penang traffic. Yeah, uh, for example, or Penang drivers. Yeah, so this is why the term recall is now considered better than the term retrieve. Rather than retrieve, we use recall yeah so here one way to define memory is the process of maintaining information over time yeah information and memory is the mental functions uh, mental function that enables human to receive maintain recall the sensation information situation that we have experienced like i uh give an example just now yeah so if you look at uh, the uh, information uh, processing, yeah, 
uh, model of memory, uh, generally there are uh, three main types of memory. We call it sensory, short term, and then long term memory. Uh, just now, if you look at the previous uh, Atkinson and Schifrin also, yeah, uh, you can uh, get the same, yeah, almost same, uh, the same diagram on these three types of memory. Yeah. All right, so the types of memory can be short term. This is how summarizes yeah, the types of memory. Yeah, long term memory. So sensory memory. Sensory memory is what you receive from the environment, or you call it when uh, information, yeah, yeah, when information comes from you from the environment, we can we sometimes we call it a sensory register, yeah. We call it a sensory register. They come to you and then you receive and then store the information. If the information is important enough, you will process them and transfer them to the short-term memory. If not, yeah, uh, they will discard. Yeah, uh, That's why you don't process everything that you see. Uh, actually, you register them. Yeah, register them. Everything, the sound of night, uh, the, 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 the sound of birds around you, yeah, the feel of wind. Yeah, don't, you don't process them. It's, uh, everything you just uh you only process things that you pay attention to uh that's why attention is very important yeah for example in class sometimes your uh your lecture will prompt okay this is very important and usually come from final okay that's your cue yeah that's your cue yeah when you have that cue and then uh you begin paying attention and then transfer it to short term memory you try to give meaning to it you try to memorize it. You actively work on it. Yeah. Uh, luckily, if uh, it is enough time and enough attention or enough processing, yeah, the encoding process will help you to transfer to long-term memory. Uh, that's why um, when you do revision, yeah, you study for the final. Yeah, this is where uh, uh, it will come back. Yeah, uh, it will come and then uh, serve you well here. Okay. So these are the type of memory, yeah. Um, of course, the three types, the main types, and then the division of sensory memory like iconic, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is visual, yeah. Echoic, echo, yeah. Ears, listening, yeah. Haptic, yeah. So long term memory implicit and explicit, yeah. Procedural is implicit, yeah. Uh, how to ride a bicycle, how to scale fish, how to cut chicken, yeah. Uh, if you are in the kitchen, this is a uh, sometimes that's why you see uh procedure memory sometimes can chop kitchen or chop vegetables very effectively. If you are chef, you are doing it professionally. Yeah, sometimes they make it sure they close their eyes and everything. Priming, yeah, episodic and semantic memory. This is explicit something that you can uh see. Yeah. So sensory memory, yeah, we go to sensory memory is defined as the brief storage of uh, information yeah uh, it is formed when uh, from information from the external environment information uh, received through the five senses and transformed in the form that is able to process yeah like i mentioned just now yeah it actually filters yeah uh, by focusing on important stimulus and ignoring unimportant yeah something which is not important to you just ignore yeah if not you have uh, information overload you cannot process everything yeah, because just sitting yeah at one place, you are exposing yourself to different environmental uh, stimulus. Yeah. Uh, and then this is the three uh, types of memory. Yeah. Iconic, yeah, visual, yeah, uh, echoic, yeah, refers to the sound, auditory memory. Yeah. Echoic actually can last four seconds, yeah, longer. Then iconic, then visual, haptic, yeah, is the memory of um, touch memory, yeah, it lasts uh, just a bit, two seconds, yeah. So, short term memory, uh, next is the short term memory, also known as working memory or active memory, yeah, short term memory is a platform yeah for 
temporary information storage yeah in which you need to work it on yeah uh something that you need uh, you, this is a platform yeah that's why it's sometime short term memory is also called working memory they are they hold all the information that we are currently thinking about so sensory memory contains the full uh image yeah received by the sensors but short term memory only retain yeah some of it how we interpret it not the actual uh bomb apa, things that uh, have been bombarded by our senses yeah so short term memory can last only 20 to 30 seconds yeah this is with rehearsal of active maintenance rehearsal meaning you practice yeah you practice you revise repeat it many times yeah and then only a short while if you do not uh, practice it. Yeah. So the rehearsal approach. Yeah. Sometimes you are mentally repeating or saying the information over and over. And rather than you are being quiet, better if you want to remember things, you say it loudly. Yeah. Uh, you saying loudly. That's why in uh, school, for example, you see uh, in primary school or kindergarten, yeah, teachers ask everyone to repeat loudly. So that you can have internal, yeah, and then echo it. Uh, not only uh, you can have also another form that you can work on, yeah, uh, echo information. All right, so this is where your magic number seven, yeah, remember Miller, yeah, just now, yeah, uh, magic seven uh, plus minus two item, plus minus two, yeah, this is the amount of information per item. That's why when you want to remember phone number, chunking is uh, uh, is helpful. Yeah, uh, we don't remember uh, okay phone number like one two three four five six seven. Rather that we go one two three, four five six seven eight. Uh, we go like that. We chunk. Uh, this is an information. Uh, this is an example of chunking. Yeah. So now, uh, iconic memory. Uh, visual sensory uh, viewing through our eyes can last one to 20 of second sensory version of uh, echoic memory uh, echoic memory can last about four seconds longer than iconic uh, haptic memory can last for around two seconds yeah it is used to evaluate the force needed to interact with yeah or holding an object, yeah. This is a touch, yeah. You pegang, yeah. Hold a cat, for example, yeah. You accidentally touch a rose petal or a hot kettle or hot cup, for example. So how do you react? Do you put it down, or you can still hold it and uh, serve people, yeah. This is one example. All right. So long term memory is defined as storage of information for a long period of time. It can last days. Uh, something last years yeah as uh, uh, I think the longest perhaps one of the longest memory that you have is your name yeah anyone uh, I don't think anyone will forget their own name yeah um, this is uh, uh, one example of uh, decades yeah lifetime of memory yeah sometimes you forgot about it yeah, if it doesn't give meaning to it, you don't uh, visit it one in, once in a while. You don't visit the information. You don't recall it. You tend to forget it. Yeah. So form through rehearsal. Yeah. In the short term memory, so that it can be transferred to the long term, and the association of short term memory with related information. Yeah. Encoding is distributed distributive process. It involves the storage of different components in different parts of the brain. Yeah? Remember when I mentioned about recall, uh, um, recall rather than retrieve, yeah? it involves pulling information from different parts of the brain to make it as a whole yeah? for you to act on it. Yeah? Usually the part here is the hippocampus yeah? uh, involved in memory. And recall is a reconstructive process bring together different memory components. Now, the recall process for a long-term memory depends on the relevance and significance of an object or event to a person. Yeah, another reason for differences in the recall process is the nature of the information or memory. Yeah, and then here they discuss the factor factor of what emotions. 
in making something more memorable. You remember uh, things that cause you to be angry. You remember more things that cause you to be happy. Yeah. Uh, these are two uh, 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 information. Another one is sad moment. Also, you remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, emotion actually it uh, transfer of uh, memories from short term uh, to long term. Yeah. You attach emotion. Hmm? So uh, this is uh, the division of the long term memory. Yeah, implicit or explicit, yeah, can be procedural, priming, episodic, and semantic. Yeah, so implicit memories refer to the information, implicit, uh, hidden, yeah, uh, meaning hidden, yeah? unconsciously and effortlessly stored in the human brain. So this implicit memory help you carry an action without thinking yeah so this is uh, usually influenced by previous experiences and uh, implicit memories can be divided further into procedural uh, knowledge of doing things you know uh, how to fry uh, an egg for example yeah um it gives you many example of uh, procedure and yeah, that that next steps yeah playing a and uh, playing a, a a sport for example you know that uh, a hockey or a soccer yeah are different from badminton yeah when you go to a badminton field for example you don't kick the shuttle uh, you know that you need a bat yeah and then all uh, what are the games with bats that you know um ping pong Ah, you don't serve ping pong the same way that you serve uh, a shuttle in badminton. Yeah, so you know how to do things. Ah, this is, uh, you see how extensive and how far. Even if you are not a sport person, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, this serve different things. Ah, I'm not a sport person myself. And priming is the activation of knowledge. Uh, priming will influence the behavior by being exposed to certain object or situation frequently. Yeah. So exposure to words and behavior of happiness will make a person happier. So expose yourself more to something uh, positive, yeah, so that uh, you can make uh, yourself happy. Yeah. This is what the, uh, if you expose yourself more to a happy situation, you actually will trigger, yeah, the memory of being happy. Yeah, this is what usually, uh, Fire more, yeah, in your brain, yeah. Fire more in your brain. That's why you become happy, yeah. Yeah, but uh, if you are uh, really uh exposed to something uh sad, you become a sad person because this uh really uh, uh what triggers you the most, yeah. Uh, you can create trigger. That's why you need to expose yourself to non toxic person. Yeah, if you're mixed with a, a group of people which cause you to be uh, negative, yeah, avoid. Yeah, avoid that uh, circle. Yeah, expose to yourself to something uh, more uh, positive in nature. Yeah, so explicit memory, also known as declarative memory. Yeah, you can put the memory into words. It refers to the information that requires effort and consciousness. Ah, you need consciousness. Yeah, you can fry an egg. And sometimes you're not thinking about it. Yeah, you need uh, a, a wok, yeah, a pan, yeah, uh, oil, yeah, stove, heat. Yeah, you crack an egg. Some of you scramble. Some of you put onions. Some of you do not put anything. Some of you only put salt. Some of you just avoid it altogether. Yeah. So explicit memory can be episodic. Yeah, discrete events. Yeah. Uh, it refers to the first-hand experiences that uh, someone have, semantic, facts, concept, general knowledge about the world. Uh, this is a, you, you can put this thing into words, episodic or semantic. Yeah. So next is the concept of attention and uh, perceptions. So information processing is highly influenced by the two uh, uh, two factors 
One is your perception. And another thing is your attention. Yeah. So perception enables you to consciously aware of a stimulus. For example, you enter a dark uh, alley. Yeah, you, you're walking. You have uh, this perception that dark alley means danger. Yeah. So you are more cautious. Yeah. You will hold on tight to your uh, purse. Yeah. Or handbag or something. Yeah. Because you are walking uh, in a dangerous area. Yeah. You become suspicious of everyone. Yeah. Because it's, uh, the situation is tough. So this is your perception. Yeah. But for normal people who just uh, pass through the dark alley every day, you know, they become more relaxed. Yeah, they are used to it. And, and then sometimes they know the person that. So they are not, uh, 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 they, are, they, they become more relaxed. Yeah. So the perceptual process sort information into meaningful categories. Uh, so perception actually helps you sort yeah, into uh, meaningful categories. Human brain is not only able to sense the environment, but they're also able to make meaning of the information in the environment. So attention, on the other hand, is uh, defined as the processing and selection of the information at the expense of other information. Meaning that if you pay attention to something, perhaps you will forget yeah, or you uh, ignore yeah, uh, other things yeah, because you cannot pay attention to everything. Yeah? So in order to process your sensory memory, attention is needed. Yeah, because they only, they, uh, your, your working memory is limited. Yeah, anything that you pay attention to, only that will be selected. Yeah, to be worked on by your working memory. So attention help to filter and perception help with meaning. Uh, these are the two uh, main functions of perception and uh, attention. Yeah. So, how do we study uh, cognitive perspective? Um, cognitive perspective is actually an one field, yeah? one aspect of uh, one pillar in uh, psychology. Yeah? So, how you study cognitive actually the same with how you study other fields of psychology. Yeah? You can involve experiments, you can use uh, experiments yeah? in which you have uh, variables, control yeah uh, you can use uh bio psychobiological or biopsychology data yeah uh, in which you study the brain as well yeah in uh, in order to study cognitive psychology you use brain scans yeah information from uh, neurology yeah to study which part is activated when um, someone is performing a task yeah for example yeah you use psychology about biopsychology data uh, you can do case studies yeah, uh, you can do case studies as well uh, to see other uh, cognitive functioning after certain diseases, uh, for example. For example, you study uh, problem solving uh, of, uh, of stroke patient after recovering from stroke. Yeah, or you can uh, perform naturalistic observation. Yeah, how they, uh, uh, your, your, your subjects or your participants, yeah, uh, 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 behave in nature environment and you can do of course a uh, computer stimulation yeah you can do computer simulation yeah this is a uh, uh, some method of uh, cognitive uh, psychology that you can employ yeah and uh, of course there are strength and limitation yeah of every approach in uh, psychology including the cognitive uh, approach so in strength for example um, cognitive psychology adopts scientific procedure, a lot of experiment, yeah, and they develop and test theories, yeah. Uh, of course, um, they have models, yeah. Uh, they like to develop models because you study something abstract, yeah, something you cannot see. You have to make sense. So, uh, a lot of models being used. Uh, for example, the models of memory by Atkinson and Schifrin, yeah. So this model actually simplify, make you see, yeah, or oh, this is how. Yeah, actually, if you examine your brain, it doesn't say the sensory register and then it doesn't say short-term memory. It doesn't say long-term memory. But we concept, uh, conceptualize this, uh, conceptualize this. So 
uh, it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense. Yeah, that's why uh, the function of um, uh, assumptions, yeah, in which we learned earlier in the chapter. Yeah, so uh, this allow us to understand mental processes that is not uh, directly observable. Yeah, we cannot uh, really see mental processes, but we come up with this concept, yeah, schemas, concept of adaptation, yeah, concept of assimilation, accommodation, and things like that. So the weakness, yeah, uh, or limitation of, uh, rather than weakness, I, I prefer to use the word uh, limitation of this field. Yeah, we tend to ignore the biology and genetic, uh, genetic aspect, yeah, uh, uh, of uh, all individual differences, because each of us uh, process information differently, yeah, and then genetic influence also play role, yeah, huge role sometimes in creating individual differences in, uh, uh in processing you know, information processing or problem solving, and. It actually, this model, although it is very helpful to help us understand, it actually provides a mechanistic view of human behavior because we it seems that we compartmentalize uh, one part. Yeah, uh, actually, it happened uh, a lot more flexible. Yeah, uh, uh, in a flexible way, but here we look at it as a mechanistic point of view. Yeah, so. We yeah uh lead to us to question that can really cognitive ap approach uh tell us about how we actually think yeah and uh perhaps whatever uh limitation by uh cognitive approach uh perhaps can be supported by other pillars in uh, psychology okay I think uh, uh at this point yeah uh we will end uh, the session. Yeah, uh, hopefully you can see uh, the others in the next uh, segment. Thank you.